It's time for the three question one for Biochem 5. Let's get going. What problem or abnormality is associated with each of the following buzzwords? So first we have boot shaped heart. So this is associated with right ventricular hypertrophy, uh, which can also be seen in Tetralogy of Fallot. Continuous machine like murmur. That's going to be your PDA. Tendon xanthomas. That's going to be seen with your familial hypercholesterolemia. Cafe au lait spots, that's going to be seen with your neurofibromatosis type 1 also, uh, as well as McCune-Albright syndrome. Tuft of hair on lower back, that's going to be a feature of an occult spina bifida. Next, what is the classic triad of tuberous sclerosis? So the classic triad is seizures, mental retardation, or intellectual disability is what it's called now, and then angiofibromas. Next question, uh, what cell type proliferates during lung damage? Remember, that's going to be your type 2 pneumocytes. All right, that's going to be it for the warm-up. Let's get to that lecture now. So far, we've been talking about genetics and gene translation from a molecular perspective. But in this video, we're going to talk about patterns of genetic inheritance. So let's start out with the high-yield stuff right out of the box. Pedigrees and modes of inheritance are about a four-star topic. You're probably going to be given a pedigree to interpret on step one. They might describe a patient with a particular clinical presentation, and instead of telling you this disease is inherited in an autosomal dominant fashion, they're going to show you the pedigree, and you're going to be asked to identify the disease. Or they'll give you a generic pedigree and ask you to identify how this disease is inherited, and that might be all that you're going to be given. So you've got to know how to interpret pedigrees. So autosomal dominant means that you only need a mutation in one of the alleles to cause the disease. So these diseases are often caused by mutations in structural genes. Now when you look at a pedigree, the squares are males, the circles are females, and the shaded individuals are affected. They have the disease phenotype. So with autosomal dominant diseases, these diseases affect both males and females, and every generation is affected. And on average, with autosomal dominant diseases, about 50% of the children in any given generation are going to be affected. Now, here's a list of common autosomal dominant diseases that Dr. Lewis discussed back in Reproduction 15. Be sure you can recognize all these as autosomal dominant diseases. In autosomal recessive disorders, only 25% of the offspring are going to receive two recessive alleles. So characteristically, about one out of every four offspring is going to have the disease phenotype. So at the top, that couple is two heterozygous carriers, and then one of their three kids has the disease. And then in the bottom generation, none of the offspring are affected, but you can deduce that they're all carriers. So autosomal recessive diseases are usually seen in only one generation. So if you see a disease in only one generation and not in successive generations, that's going to be autosomal recessive. Autosomal recessive diseases are often due to enzyme deficiencies, where if one enzyme is mutated, not functional, the other allele that's coding for that same enzyme that's functional is going to be doing all the work. So you, you might only be at 50% capacity with these enzymes. Sometimes that's going to result in a mild form of the disease, but usually it's more of a subclinical thing. It's not even noticed. But be careful because not all enzyme deficiencies are autosomal recessive. For instance, deficiency of the enzyme porphobilinogen deaminase in the heme synthesis pathway causes acute intermittent porphyria, and that's an autosomal dominant disease. But here's a list of some common autosomal recessive diseases that you should know. X-linked diseases are due to mutations of genes located on the X chromosome. So with X-linked inheritance, the sons of heterozygote mothers have a 50% chance of being affected. There's no male-to-male -male transmission because males don't get an X chromosome from their fathers. They get an X chromosome from their mothers. And then female offspring will have a 50% chance of being a carrier because the likelihood of transferring that mutated X chromosome from the mom to the daughter is 50%. So male offspring have a 50% chance of being affected, and female offspring have a 50% chance of being a carrier. And then if a woman has the misfortune of being a homozygous for the mutant allele, she can have the disease. Uh, so for that, for, for, to, for that to happen, dad would have to have been affected, and mom would be a carrier. That's fairly uncommon. But in general, affected males are going to have more severe disease, and affected females are pretty rare. So here's a list of some X-linked recessive diseases. And remember, you can use the mnemonic, oblivious female will give her boys her X-linked disorders. Then X-linked dominant disorders, on the other hand, can be transmitted through both parents. Male or female offspring of the affected mother may be affected. And if you have an affected male, all of his female offspring will be affected because they all received an X chromosome from dad. Now, I don't really have a list of X-linked dominant diseases because they're fairly low yield. 
Then the last one is mitochondrial inheritance, which is transmitted only through the mother. And all offspring of the affected females may show signs of the disease regardless of sex. Because all of your mitochondrial DNA comes from your mom, right? Let's look at number four in your study guide for just a moment and talk briefly about a couple of examples of mitochondrial inheritance defects. There are the mitochondrial myopathies, which are associated histologically with ragged red muscle fibers on biopsy. Then there's something called labor hereditary optic neuropathy. And there's Lay syndrome, which is a subacute sclerosing encephalopathy. Now, these aren't super high yield, but I wanted you to see some examples of diseases that exhibit this mitochondrial inheritance. I also have a couple of pedigrees for you to practice with. Let's look at number five. We start out at the top with two unrelated families, and two sets of siblings marry each other. Now, that's unusual, but there's no funny business going on. But then, in that third generation, these kids are first cousins, and they're coming together and having kids. So this is our hillbilly pedigree. This is called consanguinity. But the question is asking, what's the likelihood that child X will have the genetic mutation? We have to know, how did these two affected individuals get the mutation? We have to assume that this is an autosomal recessive disease we're looking at, because nobody else in the pedigree is affected. I guess you could have two spontaneous dominant mutations, but autosomal recessive would be much more common. So we assume that there are some carriers in the early generations, but these two affected individuals are homozygous. So if these two have a kid, what's the likelihood that the child X will be affected? It's going to be 100%, right? Let's look at number six next. This will get us into a discussion of some more inheritance terminology. In number six, we can tell this is autosomal dominant because it occurs in every generation and because it affects males and females equally. But the question is calling your attention to the subject's ages and the fact that with each successive generation, the disease is diagnosed at a younger and younger age. The name of this phenomenon is anticipation. Anticipation is where the age of onset is earlier and earlier in successive generations, or maybe the severity of the disease worsens with successive generations. So the classic example of anticipation is Huntington disease. All of those trinucleotide repeat disorders are going to get worse and worse and worse with successive generations. So each generation has more and more repeats, and consequently they're going to show anticipation. So granddad got Huntington at 62, the next generation got it in their 40s, and these two sons got it in their later 20s. They were all born with the mutation, but because of anticipation, it presents at a younger age in each successive generation. Now look at number seven. Number seven is kind of a tricky one. If the shaded boxes indicate phenotypic expression of a genetic mutation, what name is given to this phenomenon? So this is something called incomplete penetrance. This has nothing to do with inheritance. Penetrance indicates how often a genotype causes a particular phenotype. Incomplete penetrance means not all individuals with a mutant genotype show the mutant phenotype. So this is how a disease might appear to skip generations. The mutation is actually still present, but the phenotypic manifestation of that mutation isn't there. So this pedigree is an autosomal dominant disease, but with incomplete penetrance. So if you call this bottom generation the kids, their dad in the middle generation actually has the dominant mutation, which he got from his father, but because of incomplete penetrance, he's phenotypically normal. Let's go over some more genetic terminology that you should be familiar with. Now, some of these probably aren't super familiar to you, but that's because they're a lot lower yield than those pedigrees. So let's just walk through these terms quickly, just so you can kind of get the big picture. Codominance means that you have two alleles and neither of them is dominant. It's not autosomal dominant or autosomal recessive. It's codominant, kind of like the ABO blood types. Variable expression means that the severity of the phenotype varies from one individual to another. An example of this would be tuberous sclerosis. Some patients with tuberous sclerosis have ash leaf spots and seizures and intellectual disability and astrocytomas and rhabdomyomas. Other patients with tuberous sclerosis might just have a few ash leaf spots and that's it. That's called variable expression. Pleiotropy is where a single gene has more than one effect on the individual's phenotype. So PKU would be an example of this, where a single gene mutation could cause everything from intellectual disability to hair and skin changes. One gene, but lots of different phenotypes. The converse of that would be something called locus heterogeneity. This is where you have mutations at different loci that can produce the same phenotype. Some examples would be the fact that Marfan syndrome, MEN2B, and homocystinuria will all cause a similar Marfanoid body habitus. So very different genes, but similar phenotypic expression. The next term I want to cover is mosaicism. Now this occurs when cells in the body have different genetic makeup. Well, how does that happen? I thought all of our cells have the same DNA. 
Well, they do generally, but if you lose some of the genetic information during mitosis, you can have one population of cells with one genetic makeup and another population of cells with a slightly different genetic makeup. That's what mosaicism means. Then the last term I want to cover is imprinting, which is where phenotype differences depend on whether the mutation comes from the mother or the father's genetic material. And the classic examples of this are Prader-Willi syndrome and Angelman syndrome. Now let's talk about these two syndromes for just a second. Both Prader-Willi and Angelman syndrome are due to deletion of a gene on chromosome 15. And which syndrome you have depends on which copy of the allele is deleted. The way imprinting works is this. For some genes, even though you get two copies of the gene, one from mom and one from dad, you really only need one copy, not two. So your cells are going to either permanently inactivate the maternal allele or they're permanently going to inactivate the paternal allele. That's perfectly normal. That's imprinting. But then if you have a mutation or a deletion of the active allele, you get a disease. So in Prader-Willi syndrome, the maternal allele is inactivated in the normal way, but the paternal allele, which was supposed to be active, is deleted. And that's you know, going to cause a problem. So Prader-Willi syndrome comes from the dad, from a chromosomal deletion of the paternal allele, the father's allele. So let's go ahead and take a look at number eight in your study guide. Prader-Willi is a deletion of the proximal portion of chromosome 15. I don't think the exact chromosome number is important to remember for step one. But what is important to remember is that the defective or deleted gene is inherited from the father. So P for Prader-Willi and P for Papa or paternal. Prader-Willi syndrome presents in infancy with poor muscle tone, poor feeding, uh, characteristic facial features, these almond-shaped eyes and a downward turned mouth. Don't really get hung up on recognizing the facial features, but you can usually tell, you know, look at these patients and tell that something unusual is going on. Symptoms include hyperphagia, obesity, short stature, which comes from a partial growth hormone deficiency, intellectual disability, behavior disorders like tantrums and skin picking and OCD, and also hypogonadotrophic hypogonadism. And then with that, you have incomplete sexual development. You also have osteoporosis and delayed menarche. So this is one of the few times that you can actually have childhood osteoporosis. Now, how do we diagnose this? You're going to perform a FISH study, fluorescence in situ hybridization, and that's going to confirm the diagnosis. And then the treatment is going to be to limit access to food, and if they have short stature, you can also give growth hormone, so that's worth knowing. Now, let's compare that to Angelman syndrome. Angelman syndrome occurs when the paternal allele is inactivated, but the maternal allele has been deleted. And you can remember the M in Angelman uh, and the M in mom or maternal. Or one student from PCOM wrote in and told us her mnemonic that angels miss their moms. So it's the maternal allele that's missing in Angelman syndrome, whatever works for you. Clinically, this causes intellectual disability again, as well as seizures and ataxia and inappropriate laughter. These patients used to be crudely described as having happy puppet syndrome, which comes from the fact that they have this ataxic gait, which is very jerky and a, sort of a puppet-like gait, and they always seem to be laughing. But that happy puppet syndrome is sort of a stigmatizing term, so we prefer to call this Angelman syndrome. So one more mnemonic for Angelman and Prader-Willi is mama and pop. So the M in mama is the maternal gene. A is for Angelman. The second M is for happy mood and inappropriate laughter. And then the A is for ataxia. Then the POP, uh, P is for Prader-Willi. O is for overeating, that hyperphagia, and obesity. So overeating and obesity. And then the second P is for paternal gene deletion. So mama and POP might help you keep those two disorders linked together in your mind. Just don't get it turned around and call it mama and papa or mom and pop. It's mama and pop, mama and pop. Say it out loud a few times. It kind of locks it in. The last thing I want to cover is Hardy-Weinberg population genetics. Just in case you thought this video was too simple, too straightforward. Hardy-Weinberg genetics is more of an undergrad topic, but it's definitely testable for step one. It's actually about a four-star topic, meaning that most everybody's going to have a question on this. But what this boils down to is just knowing these few equations and knowing how to come up with these values. You've got to kind of pull this from the depths of your memory from undergrad and remember how to do this. Basically, with Hardy-Weinberg population genetics, we're looking at frequencies of two different alleles, which we call P and Q. Now, if these are the only two alleles, and 100% of the population has one of them, then P plus Q equals 1. And there's three possible genotypes. You can be homozygous for P, which is P squared, or you can be homozygous for Q, which is Q squared, or you can be heterozygous, which is PQ. And if you add all those frequencies up, that's P squared plus 2PQ plus Q squared, and that equals 1, since that's going to add up to 100% of the population. 
So that's basically what it boils down to, knowing those equations and then knowing how to plug numbers in to calculate the values. So let's get some practice with this. Best way to learn this is just to do it. Let's look at number 9 in your study guide. Go ahead and try to answer number 9, and then we'll go through that answer together. In question number 9, we're looking for the frequency of the dominant homozygote, big B, big B, and the frequency of the heterozygote, big B, little b. And we're given that the frequency of allele big B is 70%. So basically, with that knowledge, you know that the frequency of the little b allele has to be 30%. We're letting the p equal big B, so that's 0 0.7. And that means q equals 0 0.3, because p plus q equals 1, right? So you start there. Then you use the other equation. p squared plus 2pq plus q squared equals 1. You basically just plug the numbers in. So the frequency of the big B, big B, is going to be 0 0.7 squared, and that's 0 0.49, or 49%. And then the frequency of the heterozygote big B, little b, is 2 times 0 0.7 times 0 0.3, and that's 0.42, 42%. So that's it. That's really as complicated as it gets for hardy boddingberg for step one. All right, that's it for inheritance. And we have a couple more hardy weinberg problems in the end of session quiz. So go ahead and work through that long end of session quiz, and then we'll go through the answers. All right, let's get started. First question, what's the frequency of the big A, little a genotype and the big A, big A genotype if the frequency of the dominant allele is 0.95 or 95%? So this is our Hardy-Weinberg equation again. If the frequency of big A is 95%, then the frequency of little a must be 5%, right? Because P plus Q equals 1. So the heterozygous genotype frequency would be 2PQ, or 2 times 0.95 times 0.05, which is 0.095 or 9.5%. And then the frequency of the homozygous dominant genotype would be 0.95 squared, so that would be 0.9025, or 90.25%. The next question is the same kind of thing, just a little more involved. If 49% of a particular population is homozygous for a curly hair gene that's dominant to a straight hair gene, what percentage of the population has curly hair? So let's let P be our dominant curly hair gene. If 49% of the population is homozygous for curly hair, that means that P squared equals 49%, or 0.49. And if you're given the value for P squared, you can figure out what P is. So if P squared is 0.49, then you know that P is equal to 0.7. Then if P plus Q equals 1, that means that Q is 0.3. Now Q is our recessive straight hair allele. So the frequency of the straight hair allele here in this example is 0.3. So the question is asking for the percentage of the population that has curly hair. So that's a question about phenotype. Now there are two ways to figure this out. One way is to say, you know, all your P homozygotes are going to have the curly hair, and that's 49%. And then you need to figure out how many heterozygotes there are. So you take 2 times 0 0.7 times 0 0.3, and that's going to get you 0 0.42. So 42% of the population is heterozygotes. And then since this is a dominant trait, all of those 42% are also going to have curly hair. So you add 42% heterozygotes to 49% homozygotes for the curly gene, and the answer is that 91% of the population has phenotypically curly hair. The other, slightly more straightforward way to figure it out, once you've worked out what P and Q are, is to say, what percentage of the population has straight hair? Well, that's going to be the Q homozygotes, right? That's Q squared, or 0.3 squared, which is 0.09, or 9%. And if 9% have straight hair, then 91% have curly hair. That's the same answer we got doing it the other way. So it's kind of nice to do it both ways to check your work if you have time. Next, a male infant is born to a woman that's heterozygous for an X-linked disease. The father is normal. So what's the probability that the infant will be affected? Well, the probability is 50%. He has a 50-50 chance of getting the normal X chromosome from his mom and a 50-50 chance of getting the mutant X chromosome. It doesn't really matter what the father's normal because the baby got a Y chromosome from his dad, not an X. Next, a female infant is born to a woman that's heterozygous for an X-linked disease and the father's normal. What's the probability that the daughter is a carrier? Well, it's the same type of thing. The daughter got a normal X chromosome from dad, but there's a 50-50 chance that she received a mutant X chromosome from mom, so the probability of that daughter being a carrier would be 50%. Next, What's the probability that a female carrier of an X-linked recessive disease will have a child with that disease, assuming she mates with a normal male? So here we're talking about X-linked recessive diseases. So phenotypically, only male offspring will present with the disease. So there's a 50% chance that she'll have a daughter. The daughter might be affected, but with a recessive disease, she won't have the disease. She'll just be a carrier. 
then there's a 50% chance of having a son. And if she has a son, there's a 50% chance of having that mutant X chromosome. So the probability that a child will have the disease is basically 50% times 50%, which is 25%. Next, if little a, little a symbolizes a recessive disease, what's the likelihood that two heterozygous big A, little a parents will have a phenotypically normal child? So the key here is knowing which genotypes are going to be phenotypically normal. Those are big A, big A, and big A, little a. So using your Punnett square, there's going to be a 75% chance of having a phenotypically normal child. Next one. Cystic fibrosis is an autosomal recessive disorder. Two parents that are heterozygous for cystic fibrosis have a normal, non-affected child. What is the probability that the child is homozygous normal? So there are four possible genotypes here. One homozygous dominant, two heterozygous possibilities, and one homozygous recessive. But the question told us that this child is phenotypically normal. So of those four possibilities, you're going to exclude homozygous recessive because we know this child does not have cystic fibrosis. So that narrows it down to three choices. Now, out of those three choices, the probability that this child was homozygous normal would basically be one out of three choices. So your answer here is 33.3%. Next. Upon examination of a pedigree, you note that both males and females are affected with the disease in every generation. So what type of genetic disease is this? Well, that's an autosomal dominant disease. All right, that's it for this video. I'll see you next time.